which is what we're going to talk about today. One thing that I wanted to say before I start up with the meat of the presentation is that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here, right? I did not come up with, with all of this stuff by myself. Actually, instead, this work that I'm going to present to you today is a collaborative effort by Galia, uh, Bloomberg, and Google, and we're coming together to sort of work together and, and build these different tools. But first of all, you may ask, why multi-core JS? Why is it even necessary? I like JavaScript as it is right now. Uh, well, JavaScript, just to give a little perspective, JavaScript was designed in 1995 to all of you old people who are in some sort of uh, retroactive amnesia, uh, that was 26 years ago. It's, it's JavaScript is older than I am, and, and maybe older than, than a bunch of you. So it's, it's a pretty old language that was designed in a completely different world, in a completely different landscape. Uh, back in those days, uh, if, you, if you remember, CPU hardware was scaling with uh, frequency, right? So, so I remember when I got my first computer, it was all about gigahertz. It's not the same anymore. These days, CPU hardware scales with multi-core, with big little uh, sort of architecture, if you uh, know about ARM processes that are popping up these days, and, and not so much with frequency. So if you have a phone in your hand right now, uh, I hope not, but uh, you, you probably have a device that like eight cores or something on it. Uh, if you have a like one of those new shiny MacBooks with an M1 processor, it has a number of cores that, that work this way. But JavaScript, unfortunately, doesn't really tap into that because it was designed for a different era of, of hardware. The client side, on the same time, is moving to the web. And of course, like more and more people are, are developing for the web and are getting into the web, of course. But, but it's not just that, right? If, you, if you've been working on Hermes and, and React Native, if you've been working on Electron, on Tori, you know that even on non-web platforms like mobile or uh, desktop, the client side is moving to the web as a platform for uh, developing all these interfaces. On the same time, when it comes to servers, JavaScript and WebAssembly are taking over servers too. A, a great example of this is Fastly and Cloudflare's models. So if you don't know, uh, Fastly and Cloudflare each have a product that can that can help you do edge computing, which means that you can run stuff serverless on, on somebody else's computer, basically. And, and they're, they're using a lot of JavaScript and WebAssembly. So, and of course, there's no JS and other things. So, so JavaScript and WebAssembly are increasingly being run on more and more powerful machines, on, on servers, and so on. At the same time, it's important to expose some of these hardware capabilities to the software. It's not just about performance. For example, uh, when I was talking about Big Little, the, the, the basic idea behind Big Little architecture is that there's big processor, processor cores and there's little processor cores. And some of these are more power efficient, some are, are less power efficient, but they're more powerful. And the idea is that you can choose which cores you want to work on based on uh, you know what kind of application you're building. Maybe you have a chat app that don't needs to you know turn the fans on, basically. And and this is important. So so it's important to expose these capabilities to to software, including web software, including uh, you know what you're running on the browser. Why would you care about this? Well, if you're still not convinced, if your users own a mobile phone in 2021, it's likely running one of these processes with a number of cores. So, so you should probably care. If you run JavaScript or WebAssembly on a server, which is any device really, which can, which has more software cap uh, hardware capabilities than you're using right now, maybe you'd care because you're not using the full capabilities. If you build computationally heavy web applications, if you, I don't know, working on anything, uh, the the likes of uh, you know, big social networks, video streaming applications, or uh, you know, Google Docs was was something that was a driving use case for some of this work. Any big heavy web application would really like some of these these things that they're working on. Or if you just want to utilize full hardware capabilities, I mentioned uh, power saving uh, just in the last slide, uh, but some of these other hardware capabilities that are unlocked by, by this as well. That said, let's go over the old news first. Let's set the context. Uh, what is the stuff that has already happened so far? So, so Shagra was talking 
just uh, previously about all the things that you do have. Uh, you have already high level async constructs that allow work in the background, things like, uh, you know, you can use the event loop, you can use, uh, you know, at the high level, you can use promises and all these things. And you don't need to care about, uh, you know, how they're working behind the scenes, but you know that they allow work in the background somehow. You also have sort of more low level things like workers and shared workers and server vaults, kinds of workers really. And, and you can use them to have some sort of multi-threading right now. You have a post message, which you can use to sort of post messages between these different threads of execution. You have message channel and you have async await, which makes uh, you know promises and everything just much easier to work. You, you, you can have more high level uh, sort of code that can utilize some of these very uh, low level hardware capabilities. And we, we have WebAssembly, which makes things uh, much faster on, on different levels. Uh, there were some failed attempts during the way. So all these things that happened, they, they stand on the gravestones of some of these things, which we tried to do, but couldn't. So, so one example is Parallel.js. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it, it, it was a project that tried to allow some of these things. Unfortunately, it's, it's not uh, an ongoing initiative anymore. And there was SIMDJS. So any of you who don't know about SIMD, it is a CPU instruction set that allows you to, to in the parallel, do uh, arithmetic and, and you know, addition, subtractions, all the stuff that CPUs do at the low level, right? And well, some people tried to expose these to JavaScript that didn't really work. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's also a failed attempt. There were, however, not to, not to be too negative, there were some recent events. So recently, more recently, we have had atomics and shared array buffers. Uh, I, I will not blame you if you don't know about some of these features. Uh, I'll explain in, in sort of the later half of the presentation how some of these features are not really uh, friendly to work. But we do have atomics, which allow you to have atomic operations. Uh, and, and that really helps with concurrency and, and sort of parallelization. We have shared array buffers, which is a shared piece of memory between multiple threads. We have vgrefs, which give you more insight into the garbage collection process and so on. We have WebAssembly threading. So, so if you use WebAssembly right now, you know that there's some basic threading model in, in WebAssembly right now. It's, it's not very uh, well uh, well, I, I don't want to say it's not very well done, but it's very basic right now, but it works. There is threading in WebAssembly. There is also, and, and this is the fun part, there is SIMD in WebAssembly. So when SIMD.js died, well, people realized, okay, we have WebAssembly and it has more sort of, uh, it, it is assembly, right? Although it just runs on the browser. Uh, why not have SIMD instructions in WebAssembly? And since it is already so low level, we, we do have SIMD in WebAssembly now. One question that you may ask, well, I was telling you that, that we're working on all of these things in the standards space. Uh, are standards a good place to get stuff done? And for some of you, at the same time, it, it might not even be a question. Well, yeah, of course, we need to get stuff done in, in the standards space, in the open, right? But uh, projects like Project Fugu uh, will show that multi-implementer standards are not the only way to ship now. Some of you might know, not know about Project Google, but just to give an example, uh, Web USB or Web Bluetooth are not things that are that are just standardized in a way that are that are available across browsers. As a matter of fact, you can only use them on Chromium. Uh, but but still, they, they work. They are features on the web, so to say. So so it's not the only way, uh, and, and you can do things this way. However, JavaScript and WebAssembly, unlike you know other web stuff. The, the, the world in JavaScript and WebAssembly does work on a lockstep model. So, so we do work in sort of cooperation with each other. And so many big efforts have been successfully developed in standards bodies and then shipped broadly. Uh, some of these features, for example, uh, one of the features that I worked on, so I'm a little biased towards it, is temporal. And, and if you know about temporal, temporal is, is the, the uh, proposal in JavaScript. Uh, now it's being deployed to different browsers. Uh, but it's a uh, very futuristic, very uh, you know intuitive, easy to use. At the same time, very powerful date and time API for JavaScript. And for a long time, this was a big problem. And we decided to do it. It took us a long time to do it, but we did it anyway. Uh, and, and finally, now it's done. It will ship in every browser. And so there is a silver lining to that. Just uh, 
uh, you know, you just need to put in the effort to, to have these big efforts happen. So this can also happen in standards. At the same time, uh, it, this needs to happen in standards. I, I make an argument for this by saying it's important to have a coherent tool for JavaScript and WebAssembly. We could have different features that are only available in, in certain implementers, in certain engines, in certain browsers, but that's not a coherent sort of uh, things that people can build on top of. So it's important to have a set of tools that are available to everyone on every platform and that work well together. In JavaScript and WebAssembly engine teams also have been historically been more conservative about implementing non-standard things than higher levels of Chromium. Chromium can, can do certain things, but that's not true, for example, for V8, which is a, a, a team that does uh, JavaScript in, in uh, Chromium itself. And, and an example, uh, and, and sort of a side effect of this is that when this path was not taken, when things were not standardized, for example, parallel JS was not a standard, uh, strong mode was not a standard, this was seen as a mistake. And, and this was actually a big contributing factor to the failure of these projects. And we don't want to fail, uh, hopefully we wouldn't. So, so we want to take this path. With this, and, and with all this context set, I hope you don't have an echo. Uh, but uh, we, uh, let me present before you a vision for the future of JavaScript. One sort of quick disclaimer that I want to give you is that, uh, you know, I'm not sure what you were expecting uh, from the abstract, uh, but this is not the, the kind of technical presentation that, that you might expect. This is a, a vision for the presentation. I'm trying to explain what, what is the work that we're doing uh, for concurrency or multi-core. And, and what is the work that you may expect to see in the future, which we will work on. Uh, but this is not sort of something that you can do right now uh, in, in some cases, but well, it's still good to know which direction the language is headed to, right? So I hope you'll like it. Before I start with the meat of the presentation though, I, I want to give you a little background. So let me tell you the tale of two concurrency models. So JavaScript, as you might know it, has not one, but two concurrency models, even though people are really angry about how, how uh, uh, JavaScript is not really good at concurrency. We already have two models. We have first the web-like model of concurrency. So this model is sort of inspired by when to completion things like workers and so on. So, so you have a bunch of code and you say, okay, just, just take this code and, and finish it. Just, just do all of it and tell me when you're done. Uh, and, and communication between these different threads of execution, like workers, it, it happens uh, using message passing. So you have post message and you can post messages between these different workers. There's also async APIs that are a part of this. So you have promises and you can say, okay, uh, do this thing and, and return a promise. Uh, and, and you have this promise and you hold it and, and you say, okay, when it is resolved or it's rejected, I'll know. Uh, the, the best part about this model, uh, at least according to me, would be that there is no data races. There's a complete data isolation, right? You, you have a promise and uh, you know that it's not going to interfere with anything you're doing right now, so you can just go on with your uh, with the rest of your work. On the other side, we have a thread-like model for concurrency. So this is all about synchronous APIs and manual synchronization. So so think of the things like Atomic. So how do you do make sure that a resource is not being accessed at the same time by two different threads by using atomic operations or or by using logs and, and mutexes and so on. Uh, there is the possibility of data races, unfortunately, with, with this one. So this is why you need to do this synchronization. You, you can choose not to do it, but there's definitely going to be uh, some, some racy conditions with this. Uh, there's also shared memory. So, so this is sort of why you need manual synchronization, right? You have different threads of execution, and they're all accessing like some, some sort of shared memory, which you can create right now by using shared array buffers. And uh, you know, they, they can all work on, on the same set of, uh, set of uh, you know, variables. So just a little example, or maybe a little diagram to explain how things are. For the web like, you have these, these different event loops, and they're all running, and you have different memories for each of them, and they're sort of talking between each other, using message passing and so on. 
uh, on the same side, you have a thread light, uh, which has different memories, but they're sort of all tapping into the shared memory when they want to, and they have these blocks to make sure that they're not sort of interfering with one another. And they have parallel running threads of execution. The reality in JavaScript, as I was saying, uh, JavaScript has kind of both of these. So in JavaScript, you have these event loops, but then the, the, you also have shared memory. So they are talking with each other and they are sort of executing, maybe in parallel, maybe not, depending on, on uh, sort of how your system is set up. And uh, you have blocks for accessing these. And yeah, this is how we do. Now, just to go over some of these things with these two models, Viplike has a number of goods for it. So, so first good is that it's really easy to use, really easy to reason. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you're writing JavaScript in 2021 right now, you are using some of this, right? You're using workers, or if you're not, you're definitely using promises. So it's really, really easy to use, really easy to reason. Okay, I have this value, it's going somewhere, and I'll, I'll get the result later. It is causal, so things are happening in a certain order. And it is database free by construction. Now, of course, you can write some, some convoluted code that does introduce some databases, but by design, this is free from all databases. And there is isolation of memory. So, so if you need to pass messages between uh, uh, different threads, you need to either pass strings uh, or, or you need to sort of sterilize your data and throw it over. So it is a string, essentially. Also, asynchronous uh, means that things are generally smoother. So, so uh, if you if you have experience writing uh, more synchronous code, you might have noticed that it's uh, much smoother to write stuff in an asynchronous manner, and it is less focused on manual synchronization. As I was just saying, it's not not really necessary to introduce manual synchronization like blocks, and queues, and stuff. Now, of course, you can write a more complicated code that needs this, but it's really not necessary. Bad, uh, of course, the, the big one is that least performance on the table, right? Because you don't have this fine grained control or what's happening when, uh, you know, you're really leaving stuff up to the browser and up to the engine. And, and that means that the performance might not be uh, your strongest uh, thread like on the state, uh, on the other hand, is the biggest good is WebAssembly interop. And as, as I was saying, WebAssembly has basic threading. And if you have more threading on JavaScript, this means that you have interoperability between WebAssembly and JavaScript. And this is, I cannot stress more, more about how important this is. I mean, uh, you know, as more and more people are writing more and more performance sensitive code in WebAssembly, this is going to be a big thing. You know, how, how easy it is to, to write code that can bridge the gap between JavaScript and WebAssembly because many applications are, are going to have just both layers at the same time. There's also interop with Wasm GC. If you don't know what Wasm GC is, it is a new sort of initiative in WebAssembly that adds garbage collection and more sort of garbage collector semantics to WebAssembly. So, so it also sort of interoperates with that effort, which is where sort of uh, me and my team are involved. Uh, it, uh, and as I said, in the bads of that one, it, it has great performance. If you know what you're doing, you're going to do great. At the same time, the goods of web-like are the, the bads of uh, thread-like, if, if you notice what, what's happening here. So it is really hard to reason and use. And, and if I'm not wrong, many of you are probably not using threads in, in JavaScript, at least right now. And I, I fully support that. It's definitely not everyone's cup of tea. It does require manual synchronization, because if you're not doing that, you're screwed. Uh, because uh, databases, you can have databases on this, and it's designed to have databases if you're doing anything useful. Uh, and there is, from time to time, there can be a causal astonishments. There can be things that are happening out of order, and you can spend your, your day scratching your head thinking, what the hell is happening here? Uh, because of all of these things sort of uh, stacked together, it creates a sort of must be this whole kind of effect. What, what I mean by this is that it creates a really high bar of, of uh, I don't know, education, of understanding of language, of uh, you know, expertise. And, and because of this, many, many uh, new or inexperienced developers find it really hard to, to use, sort of utilize this model. And I don't think that's, I mean, uh,
you know, you're using threads, you're exposing your application to, to have more timing attacks to, for, for attackers to have more insight into what the timings are. And because the event loop doesn't vary any time. And I mean, it's, it's kind of water under the bridge right now because of Spectre and, and Meltdown. I mean, everything is exposed to timing attacks, but still, this just increases that surface even further. So, so be careful. And the idea is let's improve both models simultaneously. I mean, we already have both models, and in JavaScript, as you might know, uh, famously doesn't remove anything, it just adds. complement each other as we just saw the bads of one is the goods of one and so on so why not just just work on both of them uh, and, and see where we go so let's look at what our roadmap is and, and what we're planning to do with this next uh, a phase one for for improving this sort of multi-core experience in, in the web for web like would be more language support for asynchronous communication uh, also, the ability to spawn units of computation, spawn uh, you know, units that can do certain things arbitrarily. So you can say, okay, spawn a new thing that does this thing, uh, and so on. On thread like, we would need some, some way to have shared memory and access to shared memory. We would need basic primitives for synchronizing. So, so basic uh, primitives that can, that can do locking, that can do atomic operations, and so on. And we also need the ability to spawn threads. Uh, I mean, of course, if you can't spawn threads, how can you do that? The fun part is that if, if you've noticed, uh, I was trying to avoid any, any JavaScript words in the last one, and that was, that was for a reason. We're actually done here in phase one. So, so as you see, promises, you already have asynchronous indication using promises. You already have asynchronous, so you have really high level, you have really easy to use ergonomic promises. If you have workers, so you can spawn computation uh, and you can say, okay, have a worker, do this thing, tell me when you're done. You have shared array buffer for shared communication, atomics for manual synchronization. So everything that we talked about that we needed for phase one is actually already done. Phase two is, is going to be more interesting. Phase two is what we're doing right now. So uh, for the web life, we need ergonomic and performant data transfer mechanisms. We need a way to do faster and better and easier data transfer. We also need ergonomic and performant code transfer. So right now, I don't know how you're trying to transfer code between different contexts, but we need to make that better and faster. For thread like, we need higher level objects that allow concurrent access. So, so these objects, uh, right now you cannot concurrently access objects and, and we need to have higher level objects that can allow this. And at the same time, that, that make it really good and, and that make it really easy to do that without actually shooting yourself in the foot. We also need higher level synchronization mechanisms because right now, if you, if you didn't notice, the synchronization mechanisms that we have are not really easy to use. So we need something higher level, something that's easier to use. So PS2 by this is designed to address the biggest observed pain points, the biggest pain points that we have right now after we, we have those basic features done. So transferring data right now is really extensive, right? It's, it's the transfer tables are very limited. You, can, you have very limited stuff that you can transfer most cases you just can transfer strings and, and that's that's a limitation right and when you can transfer objects the reparenting of prototypes uh, is just not there yet right you you, you can try to transfer objects but uh, you know if, if you have objects with really convoluted prototype chains and stuff it's uh, really not going to work and often what people do is just pop the objects from one place to another uh, copy would mean that you would take, like, yeah, of course, you would take an object and you would deeply copy that into another and then throw it on the other side. And, and that is expensive, right? That's the, that's the uh, you know, uh, that's, that's the definition of expensive. You're iterating over an entire object. At the same time, transferring data is also ergonomic, even when it is or it is not expensive. I mean, it often requires serialization or deserialization. As I was saying, you can only post messages that are in the form of strings. So often you would find yourself taking an object and then you would say, okay, let, let me turn this object into JSON and throw it on the other side and then parse this as JSON. Now that's not really good. That's not really good if you're having uh, you know, crazy prototypes. That's not really good if you have big objects. That's not really good at all. 
Also, you have identity discontinuity, which means that object that, that goes from site A to B and then comes back is then not the same object because, you know, it's, it's copied, it's uh, sort of serialized and then deserialized and then again. So, so it's, it's not the same object anymore and that's not very ergonomic. People can make changes and, and things can break loose. Transferring code at the same time is basically impossible. We, we can transfer strings, we can transfer code within strings, but we cannot just transfer code. We, we cannot take a piece of code, a block of code, uh, block is, is the fun word here, you'll see in the next few slides. You cannot take a block of code and you can throw it to, to another context. So, so that's not possible yet. A proposal that we that we are making to do this, uh, and, and here's where the blocks come from, is module blocks. So module blocks aims to solve the problem that I just mentioned. It is the problem of ergonomic sharing of code. So so it is spearheaded by Surma from Google, and the idea is that well you can have modules in your files and you can import them and so on. But now you can have inline module blocks in your code. So as you see in this example here, I'm not sure you can see my cursor, but we, we have this variable called module block and it is assigned to a module block so it is an inline block uh, of code and, and we did some exporting here and, and you can then import this module block and you can see okay it is it's working as as it is and, and you can see that if you import it again it's the same thing because it's cached so everything is perfect uh, so, so, sorry, just to finish off, that is how we aim to solve the, the sharing of code problem. Now you can have blocks of modules, sorry, you can have blocks of code and, and module blocks basically, and you can pass them around and, and you can spawn workers by module blocks and so on. So it's a, it's a piece of code that you have within a variable and you can uh, transfer it from place to place. Uh, the next proposal, and it's it's not a, a current proposal, it's an upcoming proposal, is shared disjoint heaps. And shared disjoint heaps aims to solve the problem of ergonomic and performance sharing of data and code. So the idea is that, yeah, of course, right now you have different sort of event loops, let's say, and each event loop has its own heap. So, so all variables that are associated with it are in that heap, and if you need to transfer stuff from one heap to another, it cannot point to that heap, right? So, so well, heap A cannot point to data on heap B, and, and uh, all these heaps. <laughs> so, so the idea is to have sort of disjoint heaps, and, and you can all point to shared heaps and you can share these heaps with each other. So developers can separate their heaps into sort of normal heaps and, and shared heaps. The agent local heaps can point into these shareable heaps, as I was saying, but shareable heaps can, cannot point back because, I mean, yeah, these agent heaps can come and go. It's based on, on what code you're running. So the code in your shareable heap, that needs to just point to itself. And, and so you have these, these uh, heaps or these blocks of data and code that are, are sort of self-referential. They're, they're working something within themselves. You can throw them around and pass them and so on. And this transferable heap is the unit of sharing. So you can have many of these and you can share them with each other and so on. So that's it for the, the uh, I know it's a complicated proposal, but uh, uh, feel free to ask me more about this, but that's the idea of having shared heaps. So, so that's it for the web-like stuff. Uh, for, for threads in phase two, we also designed, I mean, surprise, surprise, right? We're doing the same thing. We're trying to address the issues that we have right now, uh, then, you know, look too forward into the future. So phase two for threads is also designed to address the biggest of the pain points. Uh, <laughs> the biggest pain point, I, I mentioned this just a while ago, nobody knows how to use shared array buffers and atomic spell. I mean, and, and I'm not talking like students, I'm not talking about the beginners, I'm talking like engineers at Salesforce and Google and, and Bloomberg. Nobody can write code using shared array buffers and atomics in a, in a decent way because they're so hard to sort of crack and, and understand what's happening. Impedance mismatch is also too high with these things. We need to sort of simplify things. And, and one way that we want to simplify things, and this is an onboarding proposal, is by adding structs to, to JavaScript. So the aim is, is to solve 
the problem of higher level objects that allow concurrent access. Uh, you know, you, you have plain objects right now, but they're not really uh, you know, designed to allow concurrent access. So now, you, instead of having just normal class, you can have struct classes. And these struct classes, as you can see, you, you have a constructor and you, you set an X variable, and then you can create a new instance of this struct. You can access X, well, X is perfect, but if you try to, uh, you know, create a new variable Y on this, it's sealed. You cannot do this. And if you try to access the prototype or change the prototype, no, it's not going to work because they're sealed. And so you can have these trucks and they're sort of locked down objects and, and you can use them for concurrent code because you're sure that, that you know, that nobody can do something funny with it. So, so that's it for the thread like stuff. This is what we're doing to have structs and, and hopefully it would make writing code much simpler. But, but this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg, right? What do we have for the future? What a future phase would look like? For web, we could have lighter weight actors maybe. Uh, right now, the only sort of actors we have is workers. And, and, and as you might know, workers are uh, workers take a long time to sort of start and, and heat up. So, so you need to be really mindful of what you're putting in a worker. Sometimes you can spawn too many workers uh, for something really simple. And then you're actually shooting yourself in the foot because these workers are going to take a lot of time to load. And the time they're saving you is not as much as, as the time that they're taking to load. One thing that we're working on uh, in my team is to make these things faster, the startup times and the, the, the time to spawn a worker, but it's still not there yet. So the idea is that maybe we can have lightweight uh, workers, we can have lightweight threads, and, and these can be really simple and really fast to start. And, and so this would cut, cut some of that. We also need integration with scheduling APIs. Uh, right now, things are very high level, and maybe we need more sort of uh, insight and, and more control over what's happening with scheduling. So some people are against this because they think that JavaScript should remain high level and you shouldn't have access to all these sort of core event loop things. But but why not? If, if you're a power user and you need to sort of speed up some things or, or sort of preempt some things on the event loop, you should probably have access to that. Maybe we need a concurrence standard library. Uh, if, you, if you know Node already has a concurrent standard library, everything is already done using uh, callbacks, and, and now many things are moving to promises even, but that's not true for, for the web APIs, like math and, and date and so on. So maybe we can have concurrent uh, standard library. Uh, people find really hard to write these, this kind of code and reason with it, so maybe better tools would help. We also need better integration, as I said, with BAS and GC. That's something that we're working on, but but hopefully something that, that you know, makes things really, really well. So people who write WebAssembly would find it much easier. And the same thing, do we need more conference and library stuff? So that's that's basically it for my, my talk. I, I need to quickly go over a few people I need to thank. So I need to thank Daniel Ehrenberg and Chu for all this work that they did for uh, you know this this both this presentation and the work that's happening right now. I also wanted to especially thank the organizers and program committee for JSCon for having me here and let me speak to you all about this topic. And I want to thank you. Awesome, awesome. It was, I think it was really insightful to get the, you know, the inside view of how standards are shaping up around JavaScript and multi-core and all those things. And I, I'm sure a lot of us are now more excited about JavaScript and the whole multi-core space. Thanks a lot, Jewel. It was a great talk and we learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you can always find Ujwal in the lounge area now. Uh, there'll be a table by the name Ujwal. Just hop in there, uh, pick his mind, whatever you want to ask, and I'll see you in the next talk. Bye. Bye.